so my name is uh, Say Doctor. I'm a program manager on the Azure AD B2C team. Uh, so I work on APIs within uh, B2C that we expose to developers. And I also work on some other things like GDPR compliance uh, for B2C. Uh, so there's two sessions, technical sessions, going on for B2C right now. Uh, this session is going to cover the Graph API, and then there's another session, which I believe is in the red mend room, which is covering tokens, uh, session lifetime, uh, and the like. Uh, so if you'd rather be in that session, I will not be offended if you decide to <laughs> hop out into that session. So le let me give you a a quick preview of what this session will be about. This session will be about the Graph API, what you can do in the Graph API um, in terms of uh, user management, uh, and then what's coming in the future, a kind of a preview of our roadmap. OK, so at the end of the session, you'll know when to use AD Graph and MS Graph, and I'm going to explain those two in a second. Um, and then configure, how do you configure an app to access Graph? How do you perform user? create, uh, read, update, delete operations. So this is a quick summary. We have, you know, start with what is the Graph API. Uh, right away, I want to try and give you a quick preview of actually interacting with the Graph. Uh, so we have a lab at the beginning. And then we go into some scenarios where I'll, you know, back up a little bit and talk about at a high level, where are the scenarios where you'd use Graph? Then we have a preview of what's coming. And then we have a lab at the end, which I'm not expecting that we're going to have time to do that entire lab at the end. But at least uh, I want to get you started on it and kind of explain where it will take you so that you have it in hand and you can um, at least get through the first couple steps and understand how do you build an app uh, that accesses Graph. So what is the graph? So let me start with that we have two forms. We have Azure AD Graph. This is for user CRUD operations. This is the precursor to Microsoft Graph. So it supports uh, create, update, uh, read, delete on users, and very soon, social accounts. And then we also have what we call MS Graph. This is Microsoft wide graph. This is where we'll be making all of our future investments. Uh, this is the unified API endpoint. I think uh, Alex talked a little bit about, you know, what sort of investment we're making all across Microsoft and that this is, you know, a standards compliant. It uses OAuth 2, REST, uh, JSON, blob results. Um, so it's designed to be an easy to use API across all of Microsoft. Uh, this is where you know, we're adding new investments. So uh, you'll see uh, programmatic control of B2C built-in policies and programmatic control of the identity providers like Facebook and others showing up in the MS Graph. Uh, since we have user uh, create, read, update operations in AD Graph, uh, we're not bringing that into MS Graph first, but as soon as you know, we've completed this other work in MS Graph. You know, you can expect that we will bring user uh, management into the MS Graph as well. Yeah, let me give you a short explanation. And then when we get into the AD Graph Explorer, then we can kind of see the actual difference of those users uh, in the JSON result getting coming back from the graph. So the short explanation is there are actually uh, multiple types of users that you can find in the directory. Uh, there is a native member of the directory. This is analogous to a user in an active Azure Active Directory user. This is for administrator purposes. There is a guest uh, uh, within that directory. So if you, let's say you use your company credentials to log in, like I use my Microsoft, SAID at Microsoft.com, and I type my credentials, I'm, I can be guested into a B2C directory, again, for administrative purposes. Uh, and then there's local users and social users. Uh, so those four types are all show up differently in, in uh, the directory, and, and we'll kind of see that shortly. Uh, so 
here's uh, the lab. Uh, if you could, uh, you, you've got your uh, laptop ready. We're going to uh, open up this lab. And essentially, you'll need a Azure AD B2C tenant. Um, we're going to create an admin. And then we're going to execute some queries against the graph. And uh, if you could open up this link, uh, the link is, uh, I tried to put in big font, but it's uh, aka.ms forward slash B2C graph lab one. And after everyone's got this link, I'm going to actually just run through it myself on the screen so you can follow along or you can read the lab, whichever you prefer. Okay. Everyone's got the link, aka.ms B2C Graph Lab 1. So I'm just going to run you through it, and you can even follow along just by watching me. So first thing is, I'm going to go to the Azure portal. And the first thing that we're going to do is create an admin that is in the B2C directory. So why do I need to do this? I already have a guest admin in the account. But if I am in my Microsoft.com tenant, and I log in with my say day at Microsoft.tenant, the AD Graph Explorer is going to show me the Microsoft uh, tenant, my company directory, instead of my B2C directory. So you actually cannot use a guest account while using the Graph Explorer. You have to use an administrator that exists in this tenant. So how do we do that? Well, first you need to make sure that you're in the correct directory. So in this case, I have a B2C directory called Lightcase. Uh, and I'm going to open the B2C tab, and I'm going to go down to Users and Groups. All users. And I'm going to create a new user. So not guest user, new user. And you've got to give this a name. So you're going to call it uh, admin, I think would be a good choice. Uh, it doesn't really matter uh, what you need in terms of uh, the name, doesn't really matter, but you are going to go down to directory role and you're going to make this a global administrator uh, and hit OK. Oh, yeah, yes. Sorry, sorry. So in, in, in the example, it tells you to type out the full email address. So what you actually have to do is do at, and then the name of your tenant. So it has to be light case. In this case, my tenant name is light case. So it has to be lightcase.onmicrosoft.com. Okay, in this case, I've already created this user, um, but I can Sorry, there's one other thing I wanted to show you. So while you're creating the user, you, there is a button that you can click that will show the password down below. Um, so you want to copy that password. 
so that you can go to login.microsoftonline.com and then change the password. Unfortunately, when you create an admin, it gives you a temporary password. You need to go change the password. So go to login.microsoftonline.com, take that password that it gives you, paste it in, and then it'll ask you, hey, please supply a new password. Or alternatively, as soon as we go to the link for, um, as soon as we go to the link for the Directory Explorer, it'll also prompt you to change the password if you haven't already. Okay, so now I'm going to the link that you'll find in the lab, which is the Azure Explorer, or sorry, graphexplorer.azurewebsites.net. And now we're going to use this administrator account that we just created. Okay, sorry. Here is the Graph Explorer. So notice we're signed in with an administrator that's in this tenant, and now we can actually run some of the commands. Uh, so if you go to uh, the lab, uh, one of the first things in the lab that it covers is uh, running this command to uh, get a list of all the users within the directory. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, it's hard to read from over there. Let me uh, pull it to this side and then I can pull it back. Okay, so this is allows you, this Graph Explorer is actually quite nice because it allows you to navigate all the different uh, queries that you could make against Graph, see what the results are without having to build like a command line application to call this, compile it, run it. Um, so it allows you to kind of quickly explore all the information that exists within your directory, uh, try out commands, understand how the graph works, uh, and it's a great stepping stone to then building your own applications. In this case, what we're running is a command to essentially list all the users 
that exist within your directory. And you'll see that some of them are uh, native users within the directory, um, and some of them are, uh, you'll see uh, local accounts uh, within this directory, and then you would also see um, uh, eventually we'll have the ability to do uh, create social users within this uh, graph soon as well. Um, so I'm going to keep going uh, with the slides here, and there's a couple other things we want to get through. Okay, so what, what are the scenarios in which you'd want to use the graph? The first one is a website scenario. So in this case, you've got a user using a browser. Uh, you've built a cloud-based service. So imagine this is an ESP.NET application. Uh, you've created an app registration with uh, your B2C uh, tenant. So an app registration basically gives you a client ID and client secret. It's how we secure access your application being able to talk to the graph. Um, once you have that client ID, client secret, that's what your app uses to essentially uh, authenticate with Microsoft Graph, execute queries, uh, and we essentially give your uh, app registration uh, permissions. So we give create, read, update, delete permissions to your app registration, and that's what allows your app to call these operations within Graph. Uh, so you're, you're, in this case, application has full permissions to the entire directory. So that's what gets into the, like some of the security considerations is that um, when you authenticate a user it's kind of your app's responsibility to execute the command for the correct user uh, that has been authenticated. You can't just take it for granted if a parameter is being passed in, uh, you know, change user ID 5. Uh, you can't just take that uh, GUID uh, for the user ID and just uh, blindly apply <laughs> some write operation to the directory because your application has full permissions of the directory uh, you need to authenticate which user is actually requesting you change that before you go and update the directory. Uh, mobile scenario. So the mobile scenario, you'll still need a cloud service in between. Uh, you'll need to run some ESP.NET service or you know whatever language you prefer, Node, uh, so on and so forth, that will accept request from the mobile app, your service will have uh, an app registration with full permission to the directory. Again, we'll have to, just like the last scenario, make sure that you're executing right permissions for the appropriate user, not just you know taking some parameter from the mobile application and, and, and trusting it. Uh, there is a migration scenario also. So imagine that you have a bunch of users in some previous SQL database that we're using to authenticate users, and you need to get them all into the graph. Uh, there is a migration talk uh, that is uh, right after this session. And so uh, if you're interested in that scenario, they actually have uh, great examples of how to do that migration and some of the strategies that you'd use for that. So now we've talked about AD graph and being able to do user uh, CRUD operations within AD graph. Now let's talk about MS graph, what's coming, uh, what can you expect in this API? So this is, again, the Microsoft-wide API. All the different uh, teams within Microsoft participate in this API from Office to Bing to others. Uh, we are exposing the B2C team. We're exposing uh, a series of APIs that allow you to programmatically control uh, B2C. So this would allow you to programmatically create a built-in policy, uh, programmatically update a built-in policy, programmatically 
uh, create an identity provider such as Facebook. Um, and if you're interested in being able to do these things programmatically, uh, please come visit us uh, tomorrow during the table talk from 12 to 1. Uh, we'll have a table dedicated to uh, MS Graph and talking about, uh, hey, I'm interested in the schema. What's it going to look like? We've actually posted some of that on Yammer already, uh, and we're looking for feedback. So we'd love to talk about your scenario and uh, hear, hear your feedback on this. Uh, and then the other thing is that um, GDPR, so uh, I'm not sure if all of you are familiar with GDPR, but let me talk about that for a second. Uh, so what is it? Uh, it's a regulation within the European Union, which goes into effect May of next year. Um, and it, it's very stringent in terms of its requirements. Uh, there is a set of rights that are given to this is protection for individuals. There's no protection for companies. This is about protecting um, an individual's right to privacy. Um, and if companies are not in compliance with this regulation, I believe the fine is 4% of your global annual revenue, which is pretty hefty. <laughs> so, and unlike COPA, COPA regulation within the United States protects minors. But it has some rules saying, if your service is not targeted at minors, well, then there's nothing that you have to do. Uh, GDPR does not provide you that out. It's no matter what, if you have a minor on your service that is uh, a, a you know, resident of the EU, uh, you better be following the correct rules. Otherwise, you're at risk of this you know, hefty fine that's going to be imposed. So there's right to be forgotten, right to access. This is essentially be able to export your data, right to update, uh, and rules for minors. Um, and right to be forgotten, uh, an example. Uh, so why can't you just do, we just said, hey, there's delete operation that exists on AD graph. Why can't I just execute delete? Now they're forgotten, right? Well, actually, the right to be forgotten in EU regulation means Everything, every log, every trace, um, we have to, in order to be compliant with this regulation, be able to inventory all places within uh, all data stores at Microsoft and make sure that there is no log file, uh, no trace statement, no backup, nothing that exists for this user after you execute a GDPR compliant delete. So, <laughs> uh, we are working on APIs for all of these, um, you know, right to uh, be forgotten, right, you know, export all of my data. Um, and this would allow downstream applications to be compliant with this regulation by calling into these APIs that are going to be exposed in graph. Um, so there's kind of two ways that you could imagine going at this. Uh, you could have um, a call center, which accepts, hey, you know, I would like to be forgotten. Please, you know, forget me and, you know, prove who you are to the person on the, on the phone. And now we've recorded some request and you have somebody, you know, offline within 30 days, they have to go execute some command line and go delete them from the data store. Another way of going at this is trying to programmatically within your website do all this, you know, on the fly. So you have, you know, authenticate the user using B2C, you get back a token, you then, okay, yes, this is who they say they are, and now give them a button right on the website. They click the button saying GDPR delete, and you show them a, are you sure? Like, you're really going to be gone forever. <laughs> so you click yes, and now your app calls into this programmatic API that would delete them from the directory and you know, all traces, all logs, all backups, everything, and they would be gone forever. Um, <laughs> so, so there are um, certain exceptions that Microsoft is going to apply uh, to the EU. So EU has a, an exception process. Um, and that exception process, basically, uh, you have to provide, you know, good business reason for why you are going to apply for an exception. And one of the cases where we're going to apply for an exception is for security forensics. So um, 
if we need to keep data about, hey, this person committed some crime and now they're executing a request to be forgotten uh, and we delete any trace of this crime that they've committed, uh, it seems like a problem, right? Um, but it does mean that the exception would be scoped to security forensics, meaning we can store the data for security forensics as long as it's only used for security forensics. Uh, so it, it is quite restrictive. Um, we will have essentially an, an audit GDPR API history, uh, but according to the regulation, we can only store that if someone executes a GDPR delete, we can only store that history for 28 days. And after 28 days, it's gone. And then here's the other thing that's going to show up in uh, the MS graph, which is uh, built-in policy CRUD uh, and, ID, uh, and identity provider CRUD. So this is, you know, programmatically create a new built-in policy, uh, programmatically create, con uh, configure a new identity provider such as Facebook. I mean, there's probably situations in which your application may be exposing some functionality that then other... Um, uh, say you have a developer platform of your own and you want to enable your developers to dynamically configure things in your tenant, uh, this might be useful. Uh, we have uh, a community on Yammer called the Identity, for provide, uh, Identity Advisors. If you'd like to join, you know, just reach out to me and we'll figure out how to get you on there. Um, and then we also have uh, an alias AAD B2C Preview. Um, and this is kind of how we track people that are trying out their our APIs um, uh, and you know collect feedback uh, through this alias. And then we also have this table talk tomorrow from 12 to 1 where you know we'll have a table dedicated to talking about APIs and just uh, come find me. I'm also going to bring uh, my developer counterpart uh, to that uh, and he can answer questions as well. Um, it will require it will require that um, you have administrator privileges. I believe this is the way it works. Uh, so you'll execute that command on behalf of an administrator. Um, and let's see, time check. So we have. Um, uh, about 20 minutes left, so there is uh, probably some time here to get started on this uh, next uh, lab. Let me just give you a preview of what this lab is. Uh, so this is actually writing uh, an application um, that accesses the graph. Um, and there's, uh, as I said before, an app registration that's necessary. So as part of registering your app with B2C, you need to assign specific permissions to the app. So you need to assign create, read, update, delete permissions to the app registration. And unfortunately, some of those steps uh, do require running PowerShell commands. So you'll see uh, in this lab reference to here are the PowerShell commands that you need to assign the correct permissions to your app registration in order to get uh, the app registration set up the right way. Once you've got all of that set up, um, the sample itself is pretty straightforward. You just uh, get clone a sample application that we have and uh, change your client ID and client secret and tenant name within uh, the source code. And then you should be able to compile, run it, and you could actually create a user in AD B2C using uh, this uh, graph API. Uh, if people are interested in doing this lab, I'm happy to walk around and help people. There's also a microphone if people want to ask questions about the graph. Hey, I want to hear more about the roadmap. Or, hey, I have this scenario. Help me think about how I would leverage the graph to solve the scenario. Um, so I'll kind of open it up for uh, questions. And uh, the lab is at a similar link. So you'll go to aka.ms. Uh, B2C 
graph lab two, and I'll just leave this up and I can walk around and help. Or if there is, if anyone has a question, you know, now's a time, great time to uh, talk about your scenario and uh, let's figure out what's the best uh, approach. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so let me uh, try and repeat the question. So the question was, hey, I'd like to use groups within uh, B2C to try and control permissions so users within a group would have access to a certain part of the website, for example. Um, and so how do I, in graph, find users that are part of that group? Well, I think the, the, maybe the easier graph query that would be to this user has signed in, give me the list of groups associated uh, with this user. That is quite straightforward. Um, and the other way around, I will have to refer to the graph documentation and get back to you shortly. Um, but I think there should be a way to go from a group to a list of users as well. Oh, you haven't been able to do it in one call. Okay, so let me follow up with you to see what you've got right now and then uh, see if there's any way that we could improve that, whether, whether there is something existing or even taking back that feedback back to the graph team and, and seeing if there's something you can do to... I see. I see. So that's another thing we could talk about is which filters would you like to rely on and see in Microsoft Graph? And then uh, I can pull my contacts for the graph side of things and, and see what their roadmap is. Correct. Correct. <laughs> so let me try and let me try and repeat the question. So uh, you can create users within an Azure Active Directory tenant. You can also create users within an Azure Active Directory B2C tenant. 
Uh, B2C has additional UX customization features that allow you to really brand the experience. And what is the difference between uh, signing in a user there, like a local user in B2C and an Azure Active Directory user in, uh, yeah, there's four kinds. So, so how, how, do, how do they compare? Well, uh, we do have this slide that was shown during the built-in, I think Parak was showing this slide of B2B versus B2C, right? Uh, Azure Active Directory Classic versus Azure Active Directory B2C. Um, there is essentially kind of, there are different offerings, right? The Azure Active Directory offering is targeted towards um, your organization, meaning that one tenant represents one organization. So it represents um, Boeing or Microsoft or, you know, essentially one group of coworkers. And you can do B2B in the sense that you can connect to this and say, hey, I have subcontractors that are from, you know, XYZ company that need access to my SharePoint, my Office 365. Uh, I need conditional access control over that. That's all Azure Active Directory, right? B2C, this directory represents all of your consumers, all of your customers, if you will. Um, they may be from different companies. They may be from, you know, different social identity providers. They may not have any of those. They just have an email and they need to create a new password with you. Um, but this directory is targeted towards, um, in some sense, applications that need to outsource their identity uh, claims. Meaning, I don't, as, as writing an application, I don't want to be concerned with all the security problems of uh, managing in creating users, uh, passwords and all that. I don't want any of that in my application. I want to uh, get a token, and if that token's signed with the correct authority, uh, then I'll trust it, and all the concerns related to identity are not my problem, right? Um, and so we created uh, local user accounts and social user accounts. We essentially took Azure Active Directory, and we've extended it, uh, for the B2C scenario, we've added these new types of accounts. What's different about them? Well, um, they're self-sign-up, self-sign-up creation accounts. You can't self-sign up uh, a, a native user within Azure Active Directory, but you can self-sign up a local account user. Um, there's probably some other minor differences uh, that I could uh, go you know, try and get a more comprehensive list from the team and kind of bring back to you of, hey, you know, tell me all the differences between a, uh, a local account and a, a user account that's created within the directory. Yeah. No, no there, it does make sense. So you can, you can pre-provision users within the directory. So you can pre-provision a bunch of local accounts and then, you know, send them an email saying, hey, you know, you're in the system. You're ready to go. Like, uh, click here and sign in or uh, click here and reset your password because I created you within the directory, but I didn't set your password. So click here and, you know, by virtue of, you own that email address, you've received this email, you can prove the, that you own the email by clicking the invitation link, uh, essentially. So the question was about attributes, custom attributes, I believe, in B2C, how do they work, right? Uh, um, so they both under, use the same underlying technology. So essentially we have uh, an app that is special for B2C, and it's, it's called the 
B2C extensions app. I can show you, I can go into the portal and I can show you where that thing lives. Within the B2C extensions app, um, that's where we store all of the custom attributes that you've created in B2C. So let me just walk you through that really quick. So, Yeah, so we've we've already done the work of creating an extensions app and and it serves as the means of creating all extensions to B2C and then we exto expose those custom properties to all B2C apps registered in the directory. So we're using the same underlying technology. It's just that we're doing a little bit of the hard work for you to make it kind of a, a plug and play type experience. So here's what that looks like. So I'm in my B2C directory. Let me just back out all the way to um, this B2C you know, home uh, pane here. And if I jump into user attributes, I can go click, add a custom attribute here, right? I can give this custom attribute uh, a name, so I call it whatever I want here. And then once I've created this custom attribute, um, you know, I can now, uh, during a sign-in sign-up policy, say I want to collect this attribute. Um, and then in graph, I might want to, you know, populate the, imagine this is shoe size or uh, some other information that you want to store about every user, uh, but you want to expose it to all the applications that are authenticating uh, users with B2C. And maybe I even want this custom attribute to show up in the tokens that come back from B2C. So after I've added this custom attribute, um, uh, I may want to go into a sign-in, sign-up policy, and in the sign-up, sign-in policy, when I click edit, I can say, the application claims that I want back from the directory, I want you to include this uh, custom attribute in the token claims that come back. All this data under that is for this custom attribute is all being stored in uh, an app registration. And you can find this guy if you go into the Active Directory Blade and you go into uh, it's, a, it's kind of a small font there, but it says B2C extensions app, do not modify or delete. <laughs> so essentially we've created one app registration for all B2C extensions, uh, attribute extensions, and that's where all that data is being stored. So if you actually go delete this thing, even though you'll get lots of warnings not to delete it, um, then it'll actually delete the underlying uh, uh, extension attributes that you've created in uh, the B2C portal. Yes, so the custom attributes that you create in the B2C directory, the way the technology works under the hood, you know, we're kind of hiding how the technology works, right? But uh, it's, it's in nice blades, easy to, you know, administrate portal. Uh, but under the hood, what it's doing is it's creating a custom attribute in this app registration um, so that it can store additional data about that user. Uh, and you could do the same. You could create another app registration here um, and within that app store additional extension attributes, but then those extension attributes would only be visible to your app registration and not to all the other apps. The, the value that we created here is to create one extensions app that would expose those custom attributes to all applications, all B2C applications registered with B2C. Uh, that's why we did it. So that's, that's the value that we're trying to add there. And then in this lab, um, there is uh, an example of creating an app registration uh, and, and uh, seeing the custom attributes 
that show up in the graph it's itself. Um, and it, it, it kind of even gives you a, a um, oh, sorry, in lab one, in lab one, um, there is some commands to query in AD Graph Explorer. Um, tell me what uh, ex app uh, extension attributes I've created uh, and um, find the name of those extension attributes. And then one last thing here. Uh, so I'm going to walk around and answer questions and help you out. Uh, if you want to provide, I'd love it if you provide feedback, you know, honest feedback about this session. We are going to look at this feedback tonight and try and make adjustments for tomorrow's sessions. So uh, please take the time. Thanks. Maybe others would be interested in this. So GDPR export, what is that going to look like? And uh, what can you expect? So yeah, let's, let's talk about the, the regulation itself. What is the requirement for GDPR export? So the, the regulation says that the data that is export has to be in industry standard formats. So, <laughs> so you know, uh, sometimes I think that the folks writing the regulation are, you know, have no real experience in, in programming. Uh, <laughs> but so we have, you know, lawyers and uh, program managers in a room trying to figure out what they really meant by that. Uh, and the best that we've come up with is that we would use formats like XML and JSON uh, to export the data. Um, but it does have to be comprehensive, meaning if we have log files about, you know, this user's activity through the system, whether it be, you know, button click, this user entered their username in this field, this user, you know, made it to the next page, this user's IP address was such and such, all this information has to be exported. Um, and, and so we'd, we'd use some sort of XML and JSON format to try and make it human readable and um, understandable as to what this information is. Yeah, so the question was about connected devices and oh, the information that we have. Any, any piece of information that B2C stores about that user which device they were using, what IP address they were using, all of that information has to show up. If we store it, we have to expose it in the export. Now, if we don't store it, like let's say it's transient, meaning you know, we had it in memory during their login process, we knew which connected device they were logging in with, but we didn't actually persist that information, then there's, no, there's, no, there's nothing in the regulation that says anything that we're required to then you know, save it to be able to export it. It's only about data that we've persisted within the system um, that a user has a right to know, hey, Microsoft storing data or by, you know, indirection, your company is storing data because you're using Microsoft as a hosting provider and Microsoft is storing the data on your behalf. Um, Yeah, so the question is, how do we verify the integrity of the information? That's actually something that we're thinking about. Uh, so it will have to be timestamped in the sense that, yes, this is the information up until this timestamp because it's, a, it's something in motion, right? 
you know, there'll be new data coming in. Uh, and then there's the question of, you know, being able to audit and prove, yes, I'm in compliance or not in compliance, right? So let's back up to what the regulation says. So the, regu the GDPR regulation uh, basically says that as, a, as an individual, you have a right to know what information is stored. And for the imp information that I provided, I have a right to update it. Um, so in the situation where we've stored an IP address about the user, they don't ha that's, it doesn't have to be updatable. It's... it's uh, indirect, meaning that the user didn't type that information in. But if there, if if you typed a first name, last name, uh, postal code, you execute a GDPR export command, and you sh see that data showing up in the export, and then I go to the system, I have a right to update the information that I've previously provided to something else. Uh, the way that we've, uh, we're, we're going to tackle that problem is, Again, we have graph APIs for doing CRUD operations on any attribute within the directory. And then we also have, within B2C, update profile policies. So you redirect to B2C, say, you know, let the user update all of these attributes, and they can go update that information to whatever they want to be updated to. Yeah, so the question is, what about SQL database, human resource databases, you know, other data stores within your application or your organization? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, this is only one small piece of what will be necessary to meet compliance with this regulation. And unfortunately, um, B2C itself doesn't provide uh, some capability of reaching into other data stores within your system and cataloging data. Uh, that's not a capability that exists with. Yeah, so I think, I think you'll maybe see. Um, I, I'm I'm not actually an expert uh, in what Azure ad, as a whole is doing, but I think you might expect to see some uh, guidelines or best practices coming out from Azure organization as a whole, saying, "Hey, if you want to build a compliant application, here's how you do it on Azure." Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure. Um, so GDPR doesn't say anything specific about uh, consent in the sense of, hey, I have a. There's a consent scenario where you have a third-party application. You want to provide that third-party application um, user consent to read something on uh, on that application's behalf. So on that user's behalf. So let me give you a more concrete example. Say I have a playlist, uh, and I want to give, I want to log into some third-party service and give that third-party service access to my playlist and access to go update it. Uh, there is a f there is no feature in B2C today to collect consent for a third party application on behalf of a specific user to give that third party application access that I mean give us feedback if that's something that needs to be prioritized that's not there yet as part of GDPR there is a parental consent saying if you sign up and you're less than you know 13 years of age and you're um, you know resident of one of these countries in the EU, uh, there's actually different ages for different countries within the EU. <laughs> some countries set it for 13, some set it for 14. I don't think any of them set it for 15, and then some set it for 16. <laughs> um, so you actually have to figure out which country they're part of, how old they are, and then you need to collect parental consent uh, if, they, if, if they need parental consent in order to use the service. So one of the things we're kicking around 
Uh, we have not committed to this yet, but one of the things we're kicking around is, should Microsoft provide a service for collecting parental consent via credit card transactions? So we do this for Microsoft services. When you go to um, uh, MSA today and you try and sign up for a service that's targeted towards minors, um, for COPA compliance, we actually have uh, some service that will go charge you uh, essentially a nominal fee, like 50 cents, which is donated to a charity uh, to verify that the adult is an adult and then have the adult uh, sign some agreement saying, yes, I am the parental gar guardian of this child. Uh, and now we can say uh, this parent retains control over this child going forward, meaning they can enable and disable access for their child. Uh, so we could build a Microsoft service uh, to do that for B2C as well. Um, but again, um, the charge would come from Microsoft, so the 50 cent charge from Microsoft. So we'd have to explain to the end user, hey, w you know, we have parental consent in place, but we use a third party service from Microsoft for doing that. Um, so Microsoft's gonna charge you 50 cents and you'll get, as a result, parental control to enable and disable access for your child. Um, if that's interesting, come talk to me uh, and you know, we'll have a, a great conversation tomorrow at the table talk uh, about how, what would make sense there. Because uh, we're still trying to figure out what, what would make the most sense. Right now, B2C is designed to be a brandable experience. You can brand the UI, you can brand the emails, you can you know, completely control the experience. And then you get to the parental consent and it says, Microsoft is gonna charge you 50 cents. And it, we're still kicking around that idea. Does it make sense? Or do we have to have each and every partner go figure out their own credit card transaction system in order to prove adulthood? I don't know. It's a great question. Yes. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, when if we were to build um, basically authorization uh, or consent, we would try and build it as generically as possible so that it could be used for other scenarios. I agree with that. Um, so I think we're over time here. Um, come find me if you have more questions. Uh, again, table talk tomorrow at 12. Uh, there'll be a table talking about graph APIs. Uh, thanks for your time, uh, and I appreciate your feedback if you have given feedback. Thanks.